On the 28th of November, the Northern Independence Party, which is registered with the Electoral Commission, had its Twitter account locked. A tweet calling for a waiver on COVID vaccinations was apparently enough to violate their terms. The account did not engage in any false or misleading information on the subject. Joining us today is the Deputy Leader of the Party, David Heaven. David, hello and welcome to Turn Left. Good afternoon, how are you doing? Very well, how are you? Um, I'm very good, thanks. Yeah, yeah. So, single day apart from the Twitter debacle. Well, yeah, but um, I know I sort of briefly brought it up, but can you just step by step talk about what happened in terms of the official account being locked? Yeah, so the day previously, our party had sent out a tweet in support of COVID patents being, patents being waived for the global south. This was um, not a niche point, as this had been said globally by a number of people, including the President of the United States of America. At approximately 1.47 in the morning, um, our team was notified that our account had been locked um, due to this tweet, um, and we have since not heard anything from Twitter, apart from that the account is currently suspended and our social media team has sent um, lots of messages to Twitter looking for clarification, looking for even just a conversation as to why this happened, um, and it's been radio silence. If I were to ask you personally, why do you think the account was locked? I could say that it could be for a number of reasons. Um, we, we know that Twitter um, is governed by algorithms and that it could be a possibility that it's picked up a particular word, for example, COVID, and it decided that um, it wanted to lock our account. It could be that it's politically motivated. I can't say at this moment in time because Twitter have not said anything to us. It's, it's very much a almost fog of war situation where one side doesn't know what the other side's saying or doing. And for a multi-billion dollar company, that just on the basis of the people that use Twitter being technically customers is a polling service. Well, we had recently Navara Media's channel being taken down. It was, it was deleted. It was obviously restored. When anything like this happens, you do get people from both the left and right call it censorship. Um, in terms of, you know, the NIP official account, in terms of Navara being deleted, in, in your instance, if you were to ask me, I find it strange you've had no communication back and forth in regards to the account being locked, that it was an administrative error. There seems to be nothing on it, but... To people who simply say, oh, it's clearly censorship, it's censorship on the left, would you say it's more complicated than that? I would say it's, every situation is more complicated than that. No, no situation in life is down to just one thing. However, what I would say is that I can't foresee this happening to the Conservative Party and I can't foresee this happening to the Labour Party or to the Liberal Democrats. For example, the President of the United States said the same thing. That has been retweeted through Reuters, through various news agencies, through Bernie Sanders himself, and they haven't been locked. So even if it wasn't intentional to cause political discrimination, it has caused political discrimination because they've discriminated against one party, saying the same thing as another party, yet they've blocked they've locked because they've locked one and they haven't locked the other they have clearly discriminated in some way whether that's an algorithm whether it's intentional that is just a fact in terms of trump of course he's been deplatformed from many social media do you think that was the right thing to do for big tech giants to take trump off of twitter facebook anything else do you think that was the right thing to do um there is a difference between political discourse and things that can lead to hate speech or things that can be considered as hate speech. Now, that is up for the individual to determine. Um, so that would be up for Twitter to determine when someone is using their platform the same way as it would be for Facebook. 
it would be up for the you know independent press complaints commission in this country if it was printed in a newspaper um, that is a very different situation to ours where we have simply expressed an opinion as a number of other people have expressed globally regarding the current pandemic that's going on. I can't really get into the ins and outs of every tweet that President Trump sent. Now, I, I, don't, dis I don't agree with pretty much everything the man has said, but his right to say it is a different subject altogether. For sure, yeah. And like I said, I mean, some would argue that in terms of Trump, he did incite, you know, an uprising. And as someone who was you know, formerly the president, is a very important man. It can be very dangerous, whereas the Northern Independence Party is a small political party. However, it is registered with the Electoral Commission. It has uh, a right to say what it needs to say. By the way, the, the policy is completely correct. Uh, we should be wavering patents on it so there's nothing controversial said there but do you worry about no, maybe I, under I, this I, yeah go ahead I, and i would i would hold everybody should be held to the same standard everybody should be held accountable to the same standard uh, regardless whether you're a, um, a political party whether you're an independent politician everybody should be held to the same standard whether i, I mean we haven't said anything that has breached anything at all that is, yeah. that is a fact. How has the response been? Have you had much media uh, attention from this? Have you had a lot of support in regards to, you know, obviously the whole Twitter debacle? On the first day, um, the Twitter suspension was, in effect, very, um, did what it said on the tin in that we couldn't get messages out there. However, we have a great membership that has supported us brilliantly. So we've got the message out to our members. Our members have got the messages out, and hence why I'm sat having a conversation with you, and why Philip had an interview yesterday, and that is starting to gather momentum. But we would not have been able to do that without our membership. Precisely, and I think it is important for all of us, whether you support uh, the Nippers, Northern Independence, or not. I think it is a principle of free speech, whether you're on the left or right. Even if you're on the left and you, you know, support the Labour Party and you know, don't support the aims of NIP, it is really worrying. Do you see that this government uh, going into the next few years, the whole thing with the, the protest bills and the rights in Bristol, are you seeing a much more authoritarian streak coming from the government? I know, of course, this is particularly a issue with a tech giant, but because of, this company is so big, it has to be regulated. I think it does involve the government. So... I suppose it's a two-part question. Do you see a much more authoritarian streak happening with this government? And is anything the government or any particular policies we could see that could help protect freedom of speech when it comes to big platforms such as Twitter? Well, on the first point, I've seen a more authoritarian streak in British government over the last 40 years. It has been a continual deg degradation of rights since the 1980s. It began with the trade union, then Tony Blair took it further when it came to protest, and he used certain acts within the noughties to be able to <clears throat> give the police more powers. And then again, over the last 10 years, and particularly in the last three years, we have seen a much more authoritarian streak. We have. Um, and what what and those are things that don't happen overnight. Those are things that your rights are chipped away slowly. They don't take all of, nobody ever takes all of your rights all in one go. They chip away at them and then one day you realize, oh my God, they're all gone. Uh, on the second point, yes, Twitter it is a um, multi-billion dollar US company. However, it operates in the United Kingdom. And any company that operates within the United Kingdom uh, should be held to all the laws. Otherwise, they shouldn't operate in the United Kingdom. Um, and so, yes, I do believe that the government do have the power to regulate foreign companies that work in the United Kingdom, at social media companies or land-based companies. Um, it's whether they choose to use that power is the question. And given my first answer to the first part, I can't foresee it happening anytime soon. 
Precisely, yeah. There are some people out there that, that try to make the case that Twitter and Facebook and all these other companies are private companies, therefore they have a right to kick off whoever they want. The difficult thing about that, though, is because these companies are so large. And also what we're seeing in terms of the mainstream media, it's very hard to get your voices heard. Social media is a powerful tool to get people who have smaller platforms. So I've never really bought into the argument that people say, oh, it's a private company. So it is, it is very worrying uh, what we can see in the future. Um, this is going sort of away from censorship more towards the future, but have you had contact with other smaller parties? Are you working some sort of alliance? Uh, we, we have um, spoken uh, to other parties. I think it's been shown on, on Twitter and on social media that that how an alliance of the left is working together. So um, I'm not deep in those discussions. You'd have to speak to another, mm. another member of the NEC for that. But uh, I can assure you that um, everybody on the left is trying to work together. And I suppose with the Northern Independence Party, with Breakthrough, once again, the smaller parties are starting to bubble up because the Labour Party is vehemently moving to the right. I'd like to actually get your thoughts on the recent cabinet reshuffle. Is this just another Blairite project from Keir Starmer? Well, first of all, from a leadership point of view, I would feel very aggrieved and upset should I go away somewhere and Philip Proudfoot decide to reshuffle um, our operations team or, or any of our teams without informing me. So, first of all, I think it shows horrendously crass leadership from Keir Starmer and a very insular way of thinking in that he can't even speak to his deputy about it. Um, secondly, I will make no bones about it, I don't agree with the politics of most of the people in the new shadow cabinet. And I think we need to get to a point as a country where we understand that politics of the past will not help the future. Because I make the argument all the time that centrism is actually never won an election. Because if you even think about Tony Blair, I don't think anyone really perceived this sort of moderate centrist figure. He was a candidate or perceived as candidate for change. There was a lot of excitement um, surrounded his campaign. Of course, he had obviously the money backers. He had the sun and the corporate media behind him. But I've never bought the argument that centrism can somehow win an election. I don't think it's ever worked for the Labour Party. And nobody ever expects the same from the Conservatives. Nobody ever says the Conservatives must reach for the centre to win. They've gone more and more right wing and they, and they seem to win. So I, I'm i really confused what Keir Starmer is thinking here. I understand his politics are much more to the right, but I don't see any sense of electability coming out from him, probably the whole time he's been leader. What, what is he playing at? I get your point in that centrism hasn't ever won an election, and, and I think you're right in that the 1997 election, Labour's victory was was based on the fact that the Conservative Party was so bad. That's why there was a landslide. It was something new. People never <clears throat> people never vote against the status quo if it's working for them. They never do. So that was a definite. The status quo isn't working. We need change. Since that point, Labour has bled votes over and over again. It's a common misconception that um, in 2019, it was Labour's worst ever result. Um, we could, Labour got roughly the same amount, same percentage of vote that they got in the 2005 election. But because the centre party didn't do very well, they managed to get the majority because of the outdated first-past-the-post system. Um, I, I think that Keir Starmer is running back to what he knows and what will think works. And I don't actually think he has any vision for the future of this country. And he's going back to what he thought worked before when it didn't really work. And if it had have worked, we wouldn't be in the state. The country would not be in the state that it is now. Do you think that the second referendum was a huge mistake coming from the Labour Party? Because even, I mean, I personally think it's a mistake. However, I don't think Labour would have won had they stuck to Brexit, but I think they would have done much better. But I'd like to know from your point of view, from a political party, that is a separatist movement, your thoughts on Brexit, the debate in the last few years, 
is that going to ever be a case to rejoin in the future? I'd like to know what you think about Brexit. I can give you my personal view on the situation, but I can't give you a party view on the situation. Fair enough. Yeah. Because that is, that is, that is up to our members, not up to me. My personal view is that um, people's problems in the early 2010s were exploited and that people didn't understand why people were voting for Brexit. Everybody had their individual motivation and everybody had their right to that individual motivation. What the British political system did, didn't do was it didn't try and understand its own citizens. It didn't try to answer the questions that answer the questions that they were giving. They were giving questions of why have we got more food banks? Why is the NHS running worse? And that left one campaign open to going, well, we'll just blame all of these people. And the other side of the campaign didn't have an answer to that. So you have to understand your citizens, not your citizens, but you have to understand the citizens around you. You have to understand what their situation is. You have to know what motivates them. And the political system in this country over the last, I won't even say it's 10 years because it's a lot longer than that, it's about 30 to 40 years, including new Labour, has just ignored its citizens. There was legitimate agreements with Brexit, I suppose. You did have the democratic argument, and obviously the Labour Party, traditionally Labour Party, were Eurosceptic. So I think that, of course, the official Brexit campaign siphoned off votes through racism, through xenophobia. But there's a lot of people who felt like there was an issue of democracy. And I think that whilst we could talk about austerity feeding into the idea of being Eurosceptic, I do think there would have been a healthy support for Brexit regardless, even if we had fully funded public services, because it was an issue of democracy. And like I said, the Labour Party used to be traditionally Eurosceptic. Brexit was, wasn't was that popular in the 90s, and it seemed to, well, we know where we are now. Nigel Farage never won a seat in Westminster, but he arguably one of the most powerful politicians. What do you see about in terms of Northern Independence? Of course, it's niche now, but you've, your party's only just started. There could be some real traction here, couldn't there? Uh, well, there has been for quite a considerable amount of time. We've had Plaid Cymru and we've had the SNP around in the United Kingdom for, for quite a long time. The SNP, uh, once Labour ignored Scotland, the SNP took a foothold and they haven't let it go. We, we have a look now with Wales and the Welsh Labour Party have actually, in my eyes, uh, done a reasonable thing by trying to work with Plaid rather than have them work against them. Um, so separatism within the United Kingdom has always been present. I think the way that individual places have been ignored have accelerated um, people's want to be separated from Westminster. And that's what you have to understand. It's not separated. No one wants to say we want to draw a line in the sand and we're not going to talk to these people anymore. It's separated from Westminster. It's people looking for devolved, have, they want control of their own lives because they've allowed Westminster to have control of their own lives, uh, of their lives for the last 40 years and they've ignored them. And so, yes, I do think there will be more traction and there will be um, more thought towards devolved powers. Definitely. I spoke to Thelma Walker probably a few months ago and asked her views on Northern Independence. She didn't personally support Northern Independence, but it was more of a federal Britain. Your party has grown significantly. But for people who want a left-wing alternative to the Labour Party, but don't want to break up England, how do you square that circle? How would you get support from people who want a federal Britain? How could you attract those voters? Well, it starts by talking to them. It starts by understanding their motivations and what they see as the ideal situation from them. And then in a democratic society, you come to a compromise. Now, I don't, don't get me wrong, your question is valid. It is going to be difficult. Um, there is a lot more fire in the belly for independence in the north of England than there would be, say, for example, in what, from what I've seen in the south of England. However, we're actually not the first separatist movement within England. 
um, Cornwall has been wanting its own separatist movement for quite a considerable amount of time. And again, it's about people being heard. It's about letting them tell the politicians of this country how they want their country to be run and having a conversation about it. But do you have any big plans for next year? Any internal plans, any internal elections, anything like that that we could hear about? Uh, the NEC will be uh, up for election again um, next year. And we are planning for the local elections in May. Um, this is our first fully elected NEC, so that everybody is working hard. Um, but when curveballs like this are thrown at you with Twitter, so we've spent three days now working on this Twitter issue when we could be working on issues where we could help the people of the north of England. And that's what's really upset me most of, about it, is that it's taken our time away from helping the people we want to help. In terms of the next few years, before 2024, what do you think the political landscape is going to look like if the, if the Labour Party continue to move further right or at least stay where they are? The Conservative Party in the last few months has probably had a slight softening of their votes, dipping just under 40% with the whole corruption scandal. Yeah, I'd like to know, what's the political climate in 2024 in your eyes? I think the Conservative Party are probably going to soften, not by choice, but because uh, they will feel that there is, there is a need from the electorate. I think that the Labour Party is currently on a course to self-destruction. And this is not the Labour Party that Keir Hardy started. It's not the founding principles. And so you question, if you can't stand by your founding principles, what is the point? And we've seen over the past year that quite a considerable amount of Labour's membership thought the same way, which is why they've either left or possibly been even uh, expelled from conference or not allowed to put motions. I think Labour's becoming less democratic with every passing day. And I think the only way to answer that is to give people more democracy. Uh, I think there's always the chance that things will get worse before they get better. And 2024 is not a long time away. Last question, last view you've got in terms of the climate catastrophe. Do you have a lot of hope or optimism or are you quite pessimistic about meeting our targets before 2030 or even 2050, which is clearly not good enough? But would you say you're pessimistic about the future in terms of the climate catastrophe? I would, I would, I would answer it on two points. I am pessimistic in regards to the people that are currently making the decisions about climate. I am pessimistic about their motivations and I'm very, very pessimistic about their actions. I am, on the other hand, extremely hopeful in humanity. I, am, I feel empowered by the fact that we have youth movements all over the world looking to generate interest and show that they genuinely do care. And it will be, it will be the young and it will be the youth of today that solve this problem. And they will do it based on the fact that they've watched, an in, not an entire generation, but they've watched uh, a, a complete set of politicians, again, ignore them, not listen to them rate them, play them down, and they're going to they're gonna answer it in their own way. So I, have, I hold out no hope for the people who are looking after the situation, or supposedly looking after the situation at this present time, but I am very hopeful that the youth, the, the youth of the world will hold them to account. David, I know you're busy, um, so I really appreciate you taking the time to come and talk to us. Um, and also, good luck with Twitter. I really think it's important. I hope that enough people put the pressure on to get Twitter to get their act together and get your account back on. But thank you so much for coming on Turn Left, and I hope you have a great day. Thank you very much. It's been, uh, it's been great, and I look forward to speaking to you all again in the future. Thank you very much, David.